Does that, everyone knows what the LGBTI community is um, in Canberra and has implemented a number of programs in this community, both professionally and as a volunteer. She's won three awards for this work as nominated by the LGBTI community itself. Today, um, Megan's going to be presenting around young people coming out in Canberra. And this workshop presents evidence-based research into the connections that young same-sex attracted people have with their communities and the impact this has on their resiliency levels in the face of discrimination and associated issues. Um, it's just on that table just there. Okay. Um, first of all, um, I want everybody to actually just stand up because it's really, really ridiculously hot in here. Yeah, it is. And some people have actually been sitting for the whole time. Now, I want you actually to all, after three, I want you to all say, I'm a lesbian. Okay? So, out loud, big voice. One, two, three. I'm a lesbian! Awesome. Okay. Now everybody can sit down. <laughs> Now the point of that was to get you to move, but maybe also that will give you something to think about later on. So, um, thanks for the introduction. Now, originally when I wrote this presentation, I wrote it for 45 minutes and I've got 25 minutes. So hopefully as I go through it, I won't sound like an auctioneer and, <laughs> and you won't have epileptic fits because of how fast I'm going to have to move the slides. Um, I also just want to um, acknowledge and thank um, the Canberra Lesbian, the Canberra Gay and Lesbian Tennis Club, because they actually gave me a bit of money at the beginning of the year to help me get my research out, which I'm paying um, Jenny here to actually film this, and I'm going to put it on YouTube, and the money will actually end up going to a Gender Agendas youth group, right. kind of indirectly. <laughs> we've wankled it. So, um, so yeah, this. Um, research. I was interested in finding out um, the experience of same-sex attracted young people coming out from the point of view of um, literature says that they, they that particular group of young people experiences isolation and discrimination due to being same-sex attracted and this can lead to um, impact on health outcomes. So ultimately I was interested in are they connected to their communities because when people are connected that can also help build resilience up. So that's kind of the place I was coming from was actually looking at health. Um, so when I interviewed, um, so I did this based on interviewing um, six young people and three people who worked with young people. And the young people at the time, so there were six young people who identified as same-sex attracted. Um, the ages of, of them varied at the time from 18 to 22. And they were, the interviews were conducted over a 12-month period during 2009, which I realise is a few years ago now. So. When I'm talking about this, I'm talking about this as what it was like at the time of interviews because I think there's been a number of fairly big, well, there has been big shifts since then. Um, and when I actually interviewed the young people, I, I didn't, I had to na really narrow my research. So I didn't interview any young people with disabilities. I didn't interview any Indigenous young people, any young people from any cowed backgrounds or strong religious backgrounds. Um, because I didn't, or any um, sex or gender diverse young people, because I didn't think that I could justify um, their, if there was any particular issues relating to them. So I had to really narrow it. And I also concentrated on ACT, that they had attended at an ACT government school as another kind of narrowing sort of process. Um, and the reason why the school environment is important is because it's often the first community or environment that young people might be operating within when they're coming out. So um, school is really important. So the three um, people that I interviewed, 
two of them were workers within school environments and one of them was a uh, counsellor who operated outside the school system. All three of these people have actually had significant experience in working with young people, had worked in different school environments and worked for a long period of time. The counsellor had worked for 20 years, so she had some really interesting things to say. So I'm going to concentrate uh, on what I actually found. I'm not going to talk about how I went about it, the methodology or anything. You can, I'm free, I have provided my email address and I'm around so people can come and ask me about that if you're interested. So, um, first I'll talk briefly about self-harm. So, when I interviewed the young people, two of them said they, they had not thought about self-harm at all. One said they, they thought they had some issues around eating when they were coming out. And two said um, they wouldn't self-harm and they had quite a strong response to, I would never do that. Um, I need to, yeah, they had really strong responses to that. Um, and two said they had thought about it, but um, that it wasn't to do with their sexuality. And I didn't actually give them any definition of self-harm. I just said to them, "Did you have you ever thought about hurting yourself? So I didn't say to them what it was. And when I was talking to them, it was pretty clear that they actually had ideas about what that was. And I think as people who work with young people, we know that there's lots of variations of what that could probably mean. So this was just a quote from one of the young people. So with the self-harm, sorry, with the self-harm, I the evidence that I collected wasn't enough to sort of be conclusive. It seemed as compared to sort of um, previous um, research. Um, as anecdotally, as a as a um, youth worker and somebody in the community, they seemed like a pretty average um, bunch of young people in their responses to that. So I couldn't conclude anything from that. Um, it was a bit the same with um, drugs and alcohol. They, um, their responses were sort of quite varied in what they had said that they had done or tried. Um, a couple of them, the only thing from that that I sort of thought about was that a couple of them actually really thought that it related to LGBTI culture, but I couldn't conclude anything because there was only a small sample. So the same with um, drugs and alcohol because um, according to previous literature, same-sex attracted youth are more likely to use drugs and alcohol and to self-harm, but I couldn't necessarily draw anything from that. So I talked to them about um, loneliness and isolation and all of them but one had indicated that they would felt lonely or isolated in the past um, and they all indicated that it was to do with their sexuality. And uh, when I was talking to them, they were saying to me that they thought that it was more to that what they were thinking about, they were trying to sort out their feelings and they were worried about how other people might treat them, that was the thing that kind of caused that. So um, I talked to them about their families. So at the time of the interview, a family was another thing that I didn't um, put a barrier on. And so to the young people that I interviewed, the family included their biological families as well as partners of siblings. And some of them uh, included a few close friends into that group. Um, previous literature says that family is the, can be the hardest, is the hardest group to, for them to come out to. And parents are often like the last um, people to find out about their young, their child. Um, so with this group, they um, the other thing that they will do is they will actually look around for signs in the environment as to what their um, family and friends are going to think. 
um, before they'll actually come out to their family. Um, they'll often come out to siblings first and then mother and then father. Fathers are usually the, op um, the last person that they'll come out to and siblings are often um, the first and they will often help the young person come out to parents. And this group fitted that um, previous um, research exactly. They were the same as them. And um, that young person who said that they had never come out, that was quite uh, funny. He yeah. said, I've never come out. Everybody thinks it's hilarious. Um, Sorry about this, I've got like 400 slides here. So, um, just talking about validation of sexuality, and this is all relating to being in the high school environment. Um, the experiences varied quite a lot with the group of young people that I interviewed. Um, one of the young people was bullied like mercilessly, like from you know, even from primary school, um, and another one all the way through to one of them, everybody in his year group he got on with. with. So it was quite varied. And this here, um, I asked them about things like, did was anything was there anything about same sex relationships within the curriculum? Um, was there any posters or any resources within the environment? That type of thing, and all of them. There was only one who reported that there was something within the curriculum, and it was I think it was in an English novel or something that they had studied, uh, and that was it. And um, there was nothing else throughout school that kind of validated who they were. Um, they talked to me, they said there wasn't any real posters or anything particularly visual around the school. They, were, they said that if there was, they probably would have been ripped down. Um, and um, I think there was one of the young people who actually said that there was, but it was in the welfare part of the school. Mm -hmm. So in the broader part of the school, there wasn't anything visual for them to, to connect with. And they overall, they said that same-sex attraction was just something that you didn't actually talk about. Like, it just wasn't talked about. It wasn't um, something that was known sort of in the school environment. So I'll talk a little bit about what their experiences of homophobia were. So homophobia was experienced by six of the seven young people. Um, it tended to be experienced a little bit differently according to gender. So uh, the boys generally, like two of the boys were um, bullied quite a lot and um, the other one was fine and uh, fine within his year group but the kids in the younger year groups apparently they, when they cottoned on, they were giving him a bit of a hard time. He put that down to the fact that the young people in his year group, because he was in year 10 at the time, they all knew him, he'd gone through since primary school with him and so they didn't have a problem with him. But the, the, the other young people in the younger year groups didn't know him, so they gave him a bit of a, a, bit of a hard time. Um, the young women seemed to be kind of invisible in their sexuality. Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later. So this is a quote. So the boys, um, it varied at school whether or not the young people actually came out to anybody they were at school with. So the boys that I was just talking about that were bullied, they never actually told anybody. It, it just everybody assumed it about them. I asked them about um, if they went and got any support while they were at school. Did they go and um, speak to anybody about it? Um, four of the six said they didn't know they could get support. Um, one of them had access to school youth support worker and that was a good experience for them. Um, 
the school year support workers would have just been in the schools at that time, would have been that like the second year they were in the schools that this young person would have accessed them. Um, and another one accessed the school counsellor. Um, this is what happened to one of the young fellas. He, um, what the teacher, he had this teacher who said, "Come and talk to me about anything you like," and he got on really well with her and all of this sort of thing. And he went and spoke to her, and she kind of basically said to him, "You know, why don't you just tone it down and act more like the other boys?" And he said he completely shut down then, and he didn't try talking to anybody else at school after that. There was, they also talked about um, how quite often it was about, um, like the young person that accessed the counsellor, he talked about um, what he got generally was around what are you doing that's wrong, that's kind of invoking this kind of response to you. So, and they, uh, as a group, they sort of generally had that. It's like they're made to feel that it's them and, and they were quite annoyed that um, the school wasn't actually dealing with the, the wider problem of bullying and it was more like, what are you doing wrong? And Because they weren't doing anything wrong. So there was a little bit of, I asked, um, when I interviewed the people who worked with young people, the idea was to find out if there was any differences between what the young people said and what they said, basically. and. Um, with the three of them, there was a bit of a division. Two of them said that um, they thought that um, there wasn't a lot of support, like wider school support uh, within the school environment for same-sex attracted young people. Um, they, as a group, they mostly believed that homophobia is still pretty widespread, but it had decreased over the years. And two of the three people who worked with young people believed that staff were not supportive and open so again, that whole, we just don't even talk about this ever kind of thing. Uh, the same two people uh, at the start believed that it was up to individual staff and within schools that made a difference. And this actually parallels the previous research that you've got one or, one or two people within a school environment that, um, that sort of become like the champion and uh, and that makes a really huge difference. And the person who was the counsellor who'd worked for years, she said that she'd noticed over time she might be working with, um, you know, a particular, she'll be getting referrals from a particular school and then it would change to another school. And it was because the, that champion, that staff member, had moved schools. So um, this... So with previous research, um, school remained the most dangerous place for young people to, to be, with 74% of all abuse happening at school. So I'll talk briefly about um, college. So they reported very different experiences within the college environment because there was more young people there, there was more youth subcultures, and they, that was for most of them. What, um, they didn't all go to college, but for most of them that did go to college, they found it was the first environment they were able to meet like-minded people and be themselves in. Okay. Sexuality education. Um, basically, the young people reported this was useless, that they didn't get anything that was of any help to them at all. Um, one of the young people said that um, if she wa it might have been okay if she wanted to know about having sex with men, but as for having sex with other girls, it, it was useless. Um, and they all reported that it was quite mechanical and sort of concentrated on reproductive systems and um, menstruation. And that's paralleled in other research. Just 
skip forward a bit. Okay. So with um, friendship groups, the majority of the young people had uh, another same-sex attracted friend when they were coming out. That friend acted generally as a support to them. Um, from the way they spoke to me about it, though, their experiences were often quite different to each other. Um, one of the young women um, had a male-identified um, same-sex attracted friend and he, had, he was bullied a lot, so she was um, scared to tell anybody because of his experience. Um, all of them considered same-sex attracted uh, friends to be important to them. Um, it gave them somebody that they could talk to and share experiences with. Um, they are within like a couple of years of sort of what they call coming out because um, I think that's kind of an interesting thing. I mean, when does that finish? It probably doesn't finish. Um, they had all accessed a, an LGBTI-specific support group and they had gone there to actually find specific information around sexuality and gender and to hear other people's stories to be validated. So the internet um, was a really important tool for them to connect with community and to get information. Um, when I asked them things about um, sex and how they learnt about sex, their first response was doing it. <laughs> and then their second responses were they used the internet to actually um, find out information. And they also used the internet to connect, again, find groups that had um, other youth, young people on there that they could share stories with. So the internet, um, use of the internet uh, remains a valuable resource um, for them and is in, that's in line with previous research um, that the internet is a valuable tool. And they're very savvy too with their internet use. They're really aware of dangers and things. Okay, so... Um, so with just talking briefly about labels, four of the six young people, including all three young women, identified as bisexual when they were first coming out. One of the young people still identified as bisexual, whereas the other three had, had shifted their labels. Two of the three young men identified as gay and still identified as gay when I interviewed them. Um, and the young people who identified as bisexual said they did that mostly because they thought it was easier on the people around them to, um, it's like easing into being gay. So um, although, although not conclusive, it was, um, and this is something I, I hope that more research has been done, like in this bit of time, and I'm sure that it probably is. Um, although not conclusive, there are some links between identity, gender expression, labels and behavioural expectations. In some instances, this seems to tie in with homophobia. Um, although most of the young people enjoyed interactions with different LGBTI groups, they accessed, one of the young people said they felt alienated from the group that they had attended because they felt a pressure to fit in with the labels and stereotypes within that group. So when I talk about the link to homophobia, um, the, the young fellas um, self-identified as being um, fairly effeminate, the very stereotypical queen type gay man. And um, so that's kind of, that's a stereotype that, that, that exists, that um, that's what you, it's like to be gay. And, but really what that is, is often is it's an expression of, of um, gender. So, you know, you'll often hear things like, oh, we knew they were gay when they were five in the ballerina outfit. That's got nothing to do with being gay. That's gender expression. So there seems to be a link there.
So how they felt about labels was um, similar to previous research. Okay. Um, and just I'll just quickly say the last couple of bits. So. Um, There was also um, a little bit of difference for um, the way the, the young women were viewed as opposed to the young men. Like it's, it, they seemed to think that it was more acceptable for girls to be same sex attracted and um, less acceptable for um, young men to be same sex attracted. And that um, if you, you know, that this whole thing that two women um, having sex kissing is kind of hot to um, heterosexual men, but that's actually um, something that um, it sort of devalues the woman's sexuality. And then the last thing I just want to mention is role models because um, the young people all identified they had some kind of role model to look up to. Um, the role models were people that could give them information, validate their sexuality um, and support them. Um, they all said that there weren't enough role models. They all said that just because, you know, this person's a role model doesn't mean that I can identify with them. So, you know, they're the footballer. I'm not into football. It doesn't, it means nothing to me. Um, and they all like the idea of role models more within their environment. So school teachers that are out, other people that are closer to them being out was something that they said they um, would have liked. So, and I think that's it. I feel like I forgot something really important, but I can't remember what it was. Um, so I basically concluded no, they couldn't really access their um, their communities, um, there was still levels of discrimination coming in to make it difficult. And community was defined by them too. So I didn't say I connected to the LGBTI community, I talked to them about their soccer teams or their netball teams and what they got from that. But it was pretty clear that uh, they said that um, it was pretty clear that they went to LGBTI specific groups for information and they said that if they wanted to access an interest group, to, um, they would do that because it had nothing to do with their sexuality. One of the young fellas said, I play soccer, I'm going there to play soccer, I'm not going there to hook up, so that's fine. So, and that's all. Is there any questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that was so brief, it's really difficult to put 25,000 words into 25 minutes. Oh, you've minutes. done very well. <laughs> and you do have a few minutes left for questions if you would like. A couple of questions? Yeah. Um, Megan, um, one thing I come across a lot uh, where I work is the use of the word gay. That's so gay. Um, yeah. Uh, gay, blah, 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 blah. Um, I'm always talking to young people about their legal use of that word. I wonder if uh, any of the young people you've interviewed had an opinion on it or whether you yourself have an opinion on whether, uh, whether it's effective for me to be saying that may be considered homophobic or from memory, they didn't like it, like none of them liked it. Um, and I do remember one of them specifically um, saying, it's like saying you're wrong. It's like saying you're wrong. So none of them, none of them like it. Um, I have done, in more recent years, done sort of workshops. We did a workshop in one of the high schools for year eight students and we did this sort of continuum exercise and it was sort of around gender and sexuality and we ended the sort of all the questions with saying that's gay is okay and we'd have so we had them standing on this continuum as to what they thought and there was huge debates um, and so a lot of the young people will look at you and go oh you know you don't know because you're old it's we've changed the meaning of it you know would be kind of the <laughs> thing that they would say so um it's just kind of like arguing or discussing with them until they maybe sort of get what it is. I even find it, I reckon even find an example from their life. So your opinion is it's worth the intervention? Yeah. yeah. 
Um, do you think it is, I'm, I'm out at where I work, I'm um, out with all the kids, do you think it is um, for me to be going, oh please don't use that word, do you think it's made the, the, the kids get the impression that I'm saying that because I'm gay rather than I'm saying it because I think it might offend someone else in the room? Do you think it might be more effective coming from straight colleagues or just more effective? I think it's well. I think it's always good to get um, people who we think are it's like straight people on board with that. So you know, I think it's really good if you've got um, you know, like say if you've got like a new inevitably what happens you've got a new person comes into the environment and the young people want to know about them and so they might be saying, "Have you got a husband? Have you got a whatever?" You know, I think that's those kind of opportunities are good to sort of say. Well, I might have, I might have a wife, or I might have a, and to kind of challenge it a bit like that. Mm. And they might think that you're saying that because of yourself, but um, I guess that's got positives to it too, because if they think they're offending you and they get on with you, then. Well, usually, they're my students, if they think they're offending me, they'll just say it three times. Oh, All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Having that cons consistency yeah. of response. Yeah. And that conversation as well about if someone says, oh, that's so gay, the, com the follow up conversation about trying to explore with that young person about what feeling are you trying to express when you say that? You know, language is a really fabulous thing and there's lots of different words that we can use. You've chosen that one because it's it seems easy and it's somewhat lazy, but what what And it's not actually about um, the word gay, it's about the word retard, it's about, you know, yes. all of those things that, all, the, all of the different, you know, expressions that people use that may be offensive and having a similar response to all of those. Yeah. I just remember the important thing that I had to say. <laughs> yeah, and that was, um, you know, all the young people I interviewed at the time when they were coming out, they still all thought they were the only, you know, the only gay in the village. They all yeah. thought that. And I've run um, Stepping Out, which is um, for same-sex attracted women or women questioning their sexuality in the Canberra community for a long time, and that's for women of all ages. And they all thought that too, regardless of their age. So people still think that when it's them. My concern with a lot of this... Um, was that the school environments were so heterosexist. Yeah. And um, as Peter and Jenny also talked about this morning, very gendered and very binary in thinking. And for every, you know, if you look at the statistics, for the young people that I interviewed, there would have been like, you know, a few hundred other same-sex attracted or questioning young people within that environment who were, who were silent. So that's why it's really important to... Um, to have things like, um, you know, characters within English novels or you study a drama thing or you use examples. But I think that that's, in, that's for everybody. You should be using examples of, you know, having Aboriginal characters, you know, people from different backgrounds, people with disabilities. It's actually about being inclusive mm -hmm. and it's actually about not assuming anything. So you don't assume who people are attracted to. You don't assume their gender. So it sort of comes back to things we were talking about this morning in that there's things in common but everybody's very individual as well. Mm. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.